so um, the background of my research on this topic of uh, UAVs or drones for both border uh, security and for search and rescue is uh, based on my research on the European uh, border surveillance system, uh, Eurosur, that uh, is supposed to be operational by the end of uh, this year. Uh, some of the challenges that I will um, look at today. start with on, uh, on this Eurosur uh, system. It's uh, planned for December uh, this year and it has a threefold uh, aim. Uh, first and foremost to reduce undetected entries into the EU, so that's the border control component. Secondly, to increase internal security of the EU by preventing uh, cross-border crime. That means also a border uh, security, but more in the sense of stopping illegal trafficking, uh, mentions of threats of terrorists, for example. Um, and the third uh, aim is to reduce uh, the death toll of uh, migrants at sea. Uh, because as you have probably heard of through, through media reports, uh, etc., there's what some would call a, a humanitarian crisis ongoing in, uh, in the Mediterranean due to a lot of migrants seeking to uh, cross the Mediterranean in a very uh, unseaworthy vessels and there are a lot of drowning accidents in this area. So uh, one of the, the aims that stands out here is, uh, is to reduce uh, uh, the number of deadly accidents at sea. And some of my the focus uh, that I will discuss here in this presentation is uh, is uh, uh, related to the challenges of combining border surveillance with uh, search and rescue surveillance. Uh, the system Eurosur is based on uh, the, uh, the coordination of uh, surveillance uh, of the different uh, member states of the EU bordering the Mediterranean. Uh, with the aim of creating a common surveillance picture, or a common screen in a way where information from different border guards uh, is shared. Uh, this will be done through uh, the creation of uh, national coordination centers. Uh, so there will be one national coordination center per EU member state, uh, and they uh, communicate uh, in between. Uh, and they are supposed to be able to share alerts about incidents at sea uh, more efficiently than what is the case today. Also because it goes through these NCCs who then uh, will uh, relate the information to, to the relevant uh, users. But it also is accompanied by uh, an upgrading in the technologies that the border guards uh, are using. Uh, Frontex, uh, uh, as you know, the, the EU uh, border agency ha will, will plays a coordination role here, even if it's each member state that uh, will share information uh, among themselves. Uh, Frontex plays a, a role in the coordination of this system and also in, in strengthening the, the overall surveillance uh, of the EU external borders. And Frontex has, it, over the past uh, few months, expressed an interest in acquiring drones for border surveillance, and uh, especially for the, what they refer to as the free frontier area, meaning not the territorial waters of each uh, member state, but what is beyond uh, that. 
the, the logic or the rationale be, behind uh, Eurocer is to uh, improve the situational uh, awareness of the boy <coughs> and And uh, drones coming uh, into the discussion here as they are seen as a, an ultimate tool to see better uh, at sea, to gather more and better uh, information. Uh, they are especially understood as uh, uh, being uh, potentially uh, more adapted to, to see these small vessels that uh, the suspected irregular migrants uh, often use and that more often go under the radar uh, in a way. Uh, at sea and that are uh, more likely to be caught or seen when they are much closer to the EU border. So with the use of drones, either within the territorial waters or beyond the territorial waters, um, there's uh, the idea that these vessels may be caught earlier on. Uh, and these vessels, uh, which again relates to, to the three different things that I introduced, uh, not only are these vessels uh, targeted because they're often used by irregular migrants, but it's also the same vessels that are often at the origin of uh, the deadly accidents at sea. Uh, drones are also presented as uh, more cost efficient uh, and safe than, for example, which could be the alternative of increasing uh, the number of border guards along the EU external border. Uh, and perhaps often in more um, difficult areas as well. Uh, I will start with uh, looking into some of the justifications uh, for uh, using drones for border surveillance specifically. Then I will move on to uh, looking at what the use of drones for search and rescue, and then uh, finally some of the challenges of using drones for both, uh, which is the, the case uh, here. Um, drones could be more uh, flexible. Uh, so they, you don't have the slide. <laughs> sending out border patrols uh, along the, the external border and uh, can have the ability to, to cover uh, larger areas. And as I said, this idea that they could uh, be more efficient in seeing the, the smaller uh, uh, vessels. Uh, however, they uh, raise a series of legal problems that in turn also translate into uh, several practical challenges. Uh, first and foremost, the, there is no legal framework for today for extraterritorial <coughs> surveillance, which would be the case if drones are deployed beyond uh, the EU uh, territorial waters. Uh, there is also the indiscriminate character of uh, surveillance, um, which would be uh, incapable of distinguishing between migrants in need of international protection and uh, migrants who can uh, more legitimately be returned to their uh, port of departure. Uh, but again, even if uh, one could distinguish uh, between these different categories of migrants at sea, uh, any request of, for asylum uh, should be treated by the competent authorities, uh, meaning by the national authorities on land that can we can't imagine that being done uh, at sea. Uh, so even if we could distinguish between different categories of migrants, it is still difficult to see a case where it is uh, legitimate to return them um, 
to where they came from. Um, and uh, with uh, the, the idea of being able to, to see uh, irregular migrants earlier on, um, stopping them um, and returning them earlier on also raises uh, uh, risks of violating several uh, international conventions, such as the principle of non refoulement uh, of the 1951 Geneva Convention on the rights uh, of Islam and uh, also the right to leave one's country uh, uh, in the year of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. On, uh, on what these drones uh, can actually see uh, out at sea. Um, this is the previous slide. areas and uh, what we could imagine for search and rescue operations, meaning smaller drones set up following uh, the reception of an alert, for example, and to, to monitor uh, a more a given area to, to find out where uh, the victims are located to reach them more uh, rapidly. So th there's um, an important distinction to be made between these different types of, of drones. Um, some of the current uh, technology uh, includes, um, um, as I said, drones that are sent up for specific missions to drones that can uh, stay up in the air for um, up to 30 hours or those that can stay up in the air for several weeks. Um, again, as you also may be aware of, uh, drones is a sort of common denominator for a lot of different types of technologies. It's or the drone is basically the, 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 the object that you are able to put up in the air and with a lot of functionalities related to that. Uh, from the users that we see today, you have drones with heat sensors, with infrared cameras, with radar systems, uh, motion sensors uh, and license plate uh, readers. Uh, new systems for surveillance, uh, surveillance drones that may soon be uh, available on the market, uh, for example the Argus uh, camera, can open up an, uh, up to 65 windows at the same time, meaning 65 different screens, different areas at the same time. Um, and it may see uh, objects uh, as small as 6 inches uh, square on the ground uh, and pictures of uh, 1.8 billion pixels from 17,500 feet. So it's uh, basically as high up as an uh, airplane and seeing as uh, detailed as the color of, uh, of your shirt. Um, and some of the prospective uh, <coughs> drones uh, for surveillance in the future may be uh, able to stay up in the air for several weeks. Uh, then there's the question of facial recognition. We, we know that we'll soon be there where uh, drones may see, as I said, the color of your shirt, but, uh, but the issue of facial recognition is a, a crucial one in terms also of uh, protection of uh, personal data. The smaller drones that are going closer up to the target may already today have this kind of detailed images. Uh, it remains to be seen to what extent the, the, the more constant surveillance drones that are further up will be able to, to do this. Um, 
the um, specific challenges for uh, combining. Yeah. Uh, first, uh, quickly on, on uh, the drones for uh, search and rescue operations. Um, drones might um, detect uh, potentially deadly accidents earlier on, and that's where the uh, life saving potential lies because they may uh, reach the location of the victims uh, much more quickly. A user, in addition, has uh, some advantages uh, based on it being a system uh, coordinated among neighbors from neighboring states in the Mediterranean, uh, meaning that it will reduce the risks of having member states uh, arguing about whose area the given boat was in, uh, because the more they share information, the more, the more quickly it will be clear under whose responsibility it is. And also in terms of logging the information, it will uh, ideally create a system of the watchers watching over the watchers. It's more difficult for anyone to say or to claim that we didn't see anything or we didn't know because there were alerted and uh, it's part of a common system. Um, but there are some challenges uh, related to uh, which are the who are the, the agents collecting the data, receiving the alerts, and who are those responsible for responding to a situation um, of danger. Because uh, in the example of Eurosur, there is no direct inclusion of search and rescue authorities, uh, or any requests that the member states um, improve the coordination between their border guards uh, and those responsible for search and rescue. So th those receiving the alerts from these national coordination centers are first and foremost the, the border guards. Uh, then to some of the challenges related to using drones both for border surveillance and for search and rescue um, at the same time. Uh, here the challenge is that uh, the same technology in, and for example drones may be used both to detect um, different events at sea um, from a suspected criminal activity, uh, irregular migration uh, and vessels in distress. But each of these events require very different types of responses and also by very different types of agencies. So again, uh, who is receives the, these alerts and how is uh, this transfer of the, the alerts uh, organized? There may be also some challenges in uh, the cooperation of, uh, between different states who have a different division of labor uh, uh, between uh, uh, police, uh, border guards, and search and rescue authorities, and, and who they report to and who they relate to. And uh, it's also important to remember that even if uh, these different technologies of, of surveillance, and including uh, drones, are um, maybe able to, to see sooner a situation of uh, distress, uh, there's a difference between seeing and having an alert about the situation and actually responding uh, to it. So it's important to also remember how the information about the situation uh, of imminent danger is operationalized into a search and rescue operation. Uh, some of the privacy and data protection issues that are raised again in this combination of, of border control and search and rescue operations uh, relate to um, the sensitivity of personal data of uh, potential incident seekers and which become even more sensitive uh, if we talk about uh, sharing uh, data with third countries and uh, countries outside the EU with a potentially different uh, standards for data protection. Um, there are also different types of uh, migrants um, which also become very clear in the situation where we might have drowning accidents. 
is that some uh, migrants uh, may wish to be seen uh, to trigger a search and rescue operation, whereas other, uh, others may uh, deliberately want to avoid the surveillance systems. And this is often related to the extent to which the EU has um, agreements with their country of origin for uh, rapid return. There's also an, a dilemma that is specifically uh, visible here in, again, in the combination of uh, surveillance for uh, border control and for search and rescue, is that uh, the fact that one may be able to see the migrants earlier on, to, to see a situation that might develop into a situation of uh, distress uh, before it becomes one of imminent danger, so this um, is used as a justification for extending the area that we've got under surveillance uh, as, as a sort of humanitarian justification for preventing an accident before it actually develops into uh, something more life-threatening. But this is again uh, uh, opposed to or at odds with the same migrants' uh, human rights, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the right uh, or the obligation of non refoulement uh, of states and each migrant's right to, to leave their own uh, countries. So the, these are, this is a challenge that is specifically present in the Mediterranean uh, because of this, uh, uh, the fact that it is a sea between two very different continents and that it combines uh, surveillance for search and rescue and surveillance for, uh, for border control. But we may also see that in other situations of uh, drones being used for, um, for uh, uh, border control, whether it is uh, along the US-Mexico border, uh, in Australia, as it all is already planned to be used uh, there. And uh, uh, in any case where there are dual uses of, uh, of the drones. Thank you very much. <laughs>